this episode, we are full-on spoilers for both the novel and the film. Hi, I'm Bill, also known as Matt Stagger. And I'm the Geeky Hippie. Welcome back to What the Adaptation, the YouTube show that reviews adaptations from one format to another. This week, we're continuing with our Stephen King coverage, and we have our returning guest, Lady Catherine. How are you doing tonight? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank Welcome you back. back. It's great to have you on. I get a chance to chat with you finally. So we're discussing tonight, as some of you have probably noticed, we're discussing the Shawshank Redemption adaptation of Stephen King's, what's the full title? Hope, uh, Rita uh, Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. Yep, it's Hope Springs Eternal, I think, is the section of the yes, anthology. Yes, it is the first story in different seasons, which That's is right. uh, four short novellas Stephen King wrote. It includes uh, Shawshank Redemption, The Body, which is Stand By Me, Apt Pupil, and The Breathing Method. And I hear that one's being made into a movie now. Yes, it has been option. That is oh, wow. that's cool. I'm going to have to read that one too. So what did everybody think of this movie? I'm going to assume everybody loves this movie. Is that a... Wow. Yeah. I, mean, I, yeah. I think we all saw the movie before, or I don't know if you had read the book before you saw the movie, but oh, I yes, know I, I saw the movie years ago and just read the book. And... I have to tell you, I was super happy as to the parallels. I was so happy they kept so close to it. I really enjoyed it. I, I yeah, really um, I read the yeah. book in ninth grade, I believe, is when I first picked up different seasons from the school library. So I, I definitely read it. And uh, it, it's one of those stories that I point to when people say Stephen King is just a horror writer. I'm like, no, he isn't. <laughs> no. Here you go. You know, Rita Hayward. There, there, there is a certain type of horror, you know, inherent in the idea of being locked up in a prison for life. It's not the same sort of horror most people associate with Stephen King, but th there is an element of horror of a sort to this story. Honestly, I, I would I would count this more as one of the first platonic male male love friendships movies yeah. that we had I've i mean long said it's these a two love guys story. love each other not in a romantic way but in a human being brother to brother sort of way that is just you know healthy yeah and i think I this do, is one of the first examples we got i do like the fact that even though in the book they were both pictured differently. Like Morgan Freeman was a smaller Irish guy with red beard and so forth. And that's why he was red. And Tim Robbins was um, a shorter, a uh, little more up, up tight um, banker. But I think the two people that they got to play it and the way they played it, it was seamless. The way I saw it. Yeah, they killed it. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better Andy and a better Red. And I love that little comment Red throws out. Maybe it's because I'm Irish. That just makes me laugh every single time. Because that is a straight up nod to book readers. And I love yeah, that. Yeah, it's definitely a line from the books. There's a lot of dialogue that is ripped. Oh, yeah, from straight the off the page. Oh, completely. It's perfect. Word for word. I loved it. So... What was changed from the source material that stands out to you? And did those changes impact your enjoyment of the film? Bill, anything that stands out for you? Well, I mean, a lot, honestly. Um, when they did make changes, they went big. And I think it paid off. Um, keeping the same warden, as opposed to having different wardens come in and out, and they were all corrupt. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think that showed a wider systemic system problem in the books which wasn't exactly what they were going for with the movie they wanted to show this individual experience between this group of people so i understand that that change is pretty big um killing tommy is a big change uh you know in the book he actually makes a deal and goes on a minimum security furlough program so that he doesn't have to testify that 
he met Elmo Blatch and Elmo Blatch claimed he killed Annie's wife. Right. You know what? You know what, though? When I saw that, I thought, oh, that's what they're telling him happened. And that maybe he really was killed and they just didn't show. You know what I mean? Like, that's the reason. He, oh, yeah. He's not around anymore. He left instead of yeah. knowing that he was killed. I, I just kind of was confused if he really was gone or if he was killed like he was in the show. That's how no, I he really did make book. a deal. Okay. Yeah, he really did make a deal. I read it as you understand why uh, unreliable information being given to I think it was Andy in the book, or was Uh, it to Red? It was to Red. Yeah. Well, he said it to Andy, but Red actually confirms that the kid took a deal. Yeah. Okay. I missed that that he that he he, Red confirmed it. Yeah. The words. Keeping one word into the ser- the movie, I think it was the biggest change that stood out to me, and I actually think it works better. One, yeah. it, it, it it's cheaper to not have to cast like four different actors to play wardens, and you know it, it's just so much more work. Um, but it, it it lends a continuity of villain i guess for lack of a better you know I, you could say the, the, that norton and hadley are both the villains of this story it, it focuses the animosity yeah towards particular characters as opposed to having you know <laughs> replaceable bad guys that keep coming in and which and keep like and said, having it be norton who is yeah the most hypocritical of these That's corrupt why. wardens you know, he he preaches the New Testament and has Bible verses on the wall, yet he's breaking everything. He's breaking all the rules. The way they yeah, did just... having, sorry, having the one, I think all of the six that they had in the book or whatever are all included in the one. This one did this, this right. one did this. So I think it's all as as yeah. it was if they had changed them excuse me if they had changed them like they were in the book they all had the same characteristics he had gotten uh, you know what i mean he had different characteristics from each one of them yeah, they were. which makes sense i mean when you think about people drawn to that particular job to have that particular power over people you would get people of a like mindset who you know aggressively go after that kind of job yeah, in the four, 1940s, it was a lot different, too. I'm hoping. It's a lot easier world. to be dirty. Yeah. Also but there were some easier, cons. A lot easier Sorry? to break the rules in prison, too. You know, what Andy pulls off in the movie and in the book just would not be possible, I don't think, in today's day and age. Oh, no. No, you couldn't create a person from whole cloth and thought. It's just impossible yeah. to pull off that today. Was, that was a difference too. Like he had in the book, he had a lawyer before he went to jail where he had, you know, as he was saying, put away for the hurricane coming and set up just in case it was going to hit and had all this stuff set up. And then in the show, he did it all himself. Right. So that was, a, that's a significant difference because he didn't even know in the, in the books if the, all the information was still there, if it was going to be paved over, if he could, because in the in the movie he could just go pick it up. In the books, there was a time limit. Yeah, uh, yeah, that is a significant difference, but it, it does lend to showing how crafty Andy is. Um, you get a better sense of that in the books from other things that Andy does in the books smaller things you get that build up of oh this guy is very resourceful and very smart um i get why in the movie they were like let's just have him do it all you know that that way everybody knows how smart he is there's also less cons going on in the actual movie than there are in the books oh yeah i mean it's a prison full of criminals so right with shenanigans constantly with the drugs coming in and all of that mm. kind of stuff. They didn't yeah. even touch that. Yeah. 
well, that was one of Red's big sticking points in the books was, you know, I don't do guns and I don't do hard drugs. Yep. He's like, I won't ship those in for anybody. I won't help kill anybody or help anybody kill themselves. He has enough issues on his mind when it comes to death. So yeah. I hope you get did, a little did it affect your did it affect your view of Red when you found out what Red actually did? No. No. And and in the movie, you know, the fact that they don't talk about it, they're trying to downplay it and make Red seem like a good, more of a good guy, especially, you know, except for the fact that he's the only one that admits to having been, you know, done what he was accused of, convicted of. But I think I, I always kind of, you know, it, it, up here, it, it, it always clicked in my head that Red's not a good guy, otherwise he probably wouldn't be in here, especially if he admits that he did whatever caused him to be in there you know he actually did do something bad. Yeah, that's a big difference between, you know, I accidentally killed my neighbor and her freaking newborn as well as my wife. I mean, that definitely changes my outlook on Red a little bit. Um, They, In the movie, you almost get the feeling, you know, that it's almost like he did a stick-up or something. Yeah. As opposed to something more serious like cut the brakes on his wife's car and accidentally kill, you know, two additional people that he didn't mean to. I I have a problem being upset at Morgan Freeman for anything because his voice <laughs> is odd. Well, that's fair. All I, all I think of is just narrate, narrate my life. Yes. That would be awesome. Wouldn't it? Yeah. That would be perfection. It would. But yeah, that's uh, so I didn't look down on him because I'm not one person in that. Well, obviously, they were all innocent, but not one person in there other than Andy was innocent. So I didn't think Andy any different than the others and the others any different than each other. Whether you got caught stealing the, the TV like the guy did or cut the brakes, it, it, you know, you did something. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you you know, pretty much most of them are guilty. I think uh, in the book, Red says he's met a total of ten people in his entire time in prison that he thought were truly innocent. And Andy was one of them. Yep. So, uh, the answer to this question is going to be an obvious yes. But are there any that stand out to you? Were there any scenes or dialogue taken straight from the source material and? Do you think one did it better than the other? I mean, we already established before we started recording that there's a lot of dialogue taken straight from the page. Yeah, I mean, it's almost one for one dialogue wise. It's in the 90, you know, 90 to 95% range of book accurate. Yeah, it's one of the most accurate. When it comes to dialogue. It's some of the most accurate. The only thing I could think of is what, is different because there's everything was so on that the few little things that were different like the the music in the courtyard yeah that's that added. was that but that was so important it just played just perfection you know just um it, it added to the movie it did not detract from it it did not turn oh, 100 yeah, it added so much and it gave more of who they are. And, you know, all he wanted was them to feel human again. Yeah, even if just for yeah, a few I minutes. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole thing with the beers. I mean, that's why he did that. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing. You feel like you're a free man again. Well, and you're a person you're... and not a number for a little while, you know? Right. I mean, it's no coincidence these guys are sitting here with numbers on their chest. Just like we could be doing each other's uh, tarping, doing each other's uh, roofs instead of the roof on the jail. Yeah. yeah. Just another day. Yeah. That was a beautiful was... moment. Yeah. But the things that they did add, I think, added a lot to the show. It, it wasn't a lot. Oh. It was just, it, you know, I'm not a opera person. I'm not, 
But just to hear that, imagine, I mean, being in there and just where your mind could go. Because, you know, and that's what he's, that's what he said afterwards. He goes, yeah, it was easiest time in the hole. And they're like, no, it's not. And he goes, no, he goes, I had Mozart with me. Right. You can't take that right. away from me. Your music's in here. So yeah, I believe the um, music was done by Thomas Newman, did the soundtrack, okay, and was it. nominated for an Oscar uh, for Best Original Soundtrack. So That makes sense. It was I think some it was really in 97, 97 think... Academy? No, no, it was 94. Academy? The movie came out in 94. Thought... 94, yeah. Because it's almost 30. Yeah. Yeah. I remember noticing that it was eight years after Stand By Me that this adaptation got made. So what was his first, and this is just a random question because I haven't looked or anything. Do we know what the first movie, was it Carrie that was made out of a Stephen King? Yes. Okay. Carrie was the first? Okay. Brian De Palma. Uh, was the first to buy movie rights from Stephen King for Carrie. Uh, that went into production, I think, 1972. Was it that early? Okay, I'm right. Okay. Yeah, it was right after the book came out. When the book came this out, I think, amazing. earlier that year. So, special effects, cinematography, stuff like that, anything to stand out? I think the sets, I don't Sound know where design. they filmed this. Sound design was great. Oh, um, Ohio State Penitentiary is where they filmed. So they did film it at a real prison. Okay. That's what I yes. was wondering. It almost looks like a it almost looks like a castle when they walked in in the beginning. It, it was very huge much does. Gorgeous. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that place is still there. You you can do tours of it. It's supposedly haunted. So I'm not Ooh, surprised. I should definitely go. I think the sound design was amazing. Um always noise going on in the background you could hear you know locks clicking doors slamming people talking yeah. you know little things like the guard comes out and they go hey i'm gonna tell on you you run this place like a prison i mean that's just funny that is one thing I mean, that has me chuckling one thing i noticed that they had said in the books and they did not follow in there is they did it a little bit more um I don't want to say computerized, but they had, they didn't have to go up to each door and unlock them. They'd call and the whole row would open. And in the books, they had to open each door because they hadn't, hadn't gotten to the point. Oh, yeah, they didn't have mag locks or automated yeah. systems, I don't think. Yeah, yeah that movie, was the only in, thing. In the movie, he escapes before 1975, don't they? Don't they t accelerate the timeline in the movie? Um, yes, he was only there so. twenty. He was only there twenty years instead of twenty-seven. Okay, so it was in the sixties that he escapes in the book or in the movie. Yeah, um, uh, judge him by the um, car and sort of fashion when Andy actually goes to the bank. I assumed it was the sixties in the uh, movie. That's what I was thinking. But yeah, I think so, in the book it was tw it was twenty eight years that Andy ended up serving. He kept because Red kept going. Why didn't he leave earlier? Why didn't he leave earlier? You know, thinking about why did it take him so long? Because I know he did. But how long? When did Red get out? I don't remember. In the was book, nineteen seventy seven. Yeah. In the book. Uh, so it after. wasn't that. Okay. He serves 40 years total. So I'm not sure exactly when he's incarcerated. I think he went in in 37. Uh, Mid-late 30s is when I believe it said he went in at the age of 20. So I do, I do love the fact that if you watch the behind the scenes, um, when he's at his uh, parole hearing, they open the folder and you see the very young uh, picture. That's Morgan Freeman's son. Nice. Is it? I was wondering who that was. I was wondering if he's they also found in it the old... movie. He's really? one of the guys. He's wearing a cap and he uh, 
when Andy first gets there and they're walking up, he's the one that goes, Ooh, new fish, new fish. Okay. Oh, That's Morgan right. Freeman. Okay. Son. So, yeah. So he got to be in it twice, picture, and he got to actually get some lines in. Too. One of the oh, technical awesome. things that they did with this movie that I think was just brilliant, and I don't know if it was what they were not, one of the things they not were nominated for, was the makeup, the aging makeup that they did. Because everybody's so baby-faced at the beginning of the movie, and they look naturally older. It doesn't look, you know, as somebody who's been watching movies and TV for decades now and see how better, much better we've gotten with aging makeup, going all the way back to like Star Trek when they did that eight episode where they all aged. <clears throat> this was, a lot of it was subtle work on the aging. But yeah, I, I it was the done makeup, subtly and I appreciate that. Uh, the crow's feet around the eyes, the slight graying of the hair, just little bits of wrinkling around the face, you know, over the, you know, the course of the movie. And it just, it was brilliant. Do you think that they were older and playing younger to start with? I think they were like halfway is my guess you know yeah you know so they they did probably a little bit of smoothing out of you know you know a little bit of makeup and pulling back the, the skin you know face. just to smooth yeah. out re wrinkles at the beginning um i'm sure there were an actor or two that were wearing hair pieces or were wearing hats specifically so you didn't notice the balding some of these actors had um probably. but they all they just the aging and you look at what most of these actors look like at the older versions, you know, what they look like in real life at that age. And it's, it, it, that's pretty much how these guys aged, you know? Yeah. It's, it's very accurate to how they actually end up. So, yeah. I had a question in the book was something stood out to me and I didn't understand it. It was the gentleman who had nursed the bird, the bird is flew away Brooks, and then yes. yeah and later they found jake the bird in uh like a uh sheets out in the um out in the the you know the square and okay. they found him dead like in yeah. sheets so did he really not leave and he was killed by him or why no. would he be wrapped up in sheets um he, Jake never learned how to survive on his own. Okay. He was so entirely he raised by Brooks. So by setting the bird free, he actually condemned it, which is exactly what the state did to Brooks. Okay. So those two parallels are supposed to be recognized yeah. that, okay, you know, by, you know, institutionalizing these people for this amount of time and this much control by then letting them go at this late stage in their life, it's basically a death sentence. You've basically taken, they had a life sentence, you yeah. took their life. That's one thing. Yeah, the there's movie, no way they're going to be able to function. One of the minor changes in dialogue and, well, just in the writing in the movie, deals with the fact, in the movie, they, they show Red after he's paroled, asking permission to use the bathroom. Hey, boss, can I use the bathroom? Where Red makes a point of talking about how his body was so trained, his time to use the restroom was 25 past the hour. 20 minutes past the hour, he'd start to have to go. If he wasn't able to go at 30 past, he, he didn't have to go. He just, his body Next was hour. Like, oh, you know? And that plays, I think, more, you know, it, it just reinforces that institutionalization that goes on. By shifting it, yeah, it makes it easier for and quicker to get the point across, but I don't think it gets it across as well in the movie. He he does say it. He says, you know, for, for 40 years, I haven't been able to take a piss without permission. To right. this day, I still can't. So we just, still get the re reference. Yeah, I just, just don't think it hits home as, it doesn't hit home as hard. That's not saying they did it wrong. I just, I don't think it's as oh, much yeah, of an impact. It's not as much of an impact of 
the to the point where the body becomes physically trained where you don't think you have to pee or poop if it's not your time to pee or poop you know right. whether you re, re, you know sense. ask for permission or not All yeah right. i loved it so let's move on to casting choices i'm gonna say something that's already annoyed bill but let me get the, let me be clear. Oh I'm not God. saying the actor didn't do a good job. The actor did a I, great I job. I understand. I just don't. After listening to the book, I don't see Tim Robbins as Andy Dufresne anymore. It just it it doesn't click. I understand the points you've made that you know, but no, you don't. I probably don't. I guess I don't. But it just it doesn't Why? click. Why? Why? Explain to me why it doesn't. Did... Well, it has a lot of it has to do probably, you know, not just is it twice he's referred to as being small, but it's also probably in the narrator that I listened to made Andy do Andy Dufresne's voice was the sounded like the voice of a small little pipsqueak guy who is the least bit threatening. He, he, he's not threatening at all. And I, I, I think that was that that was the impression that, you know, that's why Red picked him out as being the one to go fish, you know, to be the first to break. Because it just I don't know. I, I think he was wrong cast. I think Tim Rounds was wrong casting, but he did a great job. So success, they did their you know, casting, I guess, was a success. I just don't buy it as much as I did before reading the book. Okay, here's my thing. You can accept changes with other characters, but you can't accept that change. So you are using selective, perhaps selective disp uh, disposition of disbelief. So you can set it aside for Red, but you can't set it aside for Andy. That it's is very freaking selective, and that's my I, problem. I, I, I don't see the changes they made with casting of Red as lessening or increasing the intimidation factor Red has. By casting Tim Robbins, you're increasing the intimidation factor no, of Andy Dufresne. You're not. For somebody at 5'6", five, 5'5 five, five and 3 quarters, Tim Robbins is a monster-sized man. You know, for Dude, somebody my somebody size. somebody who has hugged people that big at Jordan Con, particularly her brothers, let me tell you, I am not intimidated by them. So I think that's a you problem and not a uh, story Yeah, hey, I didn't say it wasn't. I didn't say it wasn't a me problem. I, it, it probably is me a problem. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just I, saying, I, I you're understand. very selective about this sort of thing, and, and this time it's hype. The way he carried himself, though, and he tried yeah, to very minimize non himself and the the thinness of him and the downtrodden the and the i i think that even though he was too tall he was too tall if you go from just what it says in the books you know oh they need to get a little guy in there to do it because they couldn't get a big guy in there he isn't a big guy he's a tall guy and that's yeah. the only yeah. difference and if he was a if he's a foot shorter, um, would would that have been a better? According From, to him, yeah. yes. <laughs> it, it would have. I, I wouldn't have had much. Uh, it, it wouldn't have been so separated separated from the Andy that I had in my memory of the movie. You know, from when I watched it back in the nineties to reading the book Friday, and like that's that's tim robbins character you know that's like it, it, it's like casting big bird to play the tweety bird is what it feels like you know one's cute and adorable the other is this big scary yellow and orange thing you know really i mean okay who is more intimidating mike tyson or kareem abdul jabbar okay physically well, who is more intimidating to you whoever's standing closer to me <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. If Mike Tyson is within punching distance, I'm scared. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. But you know, but I, yeah, it I, would totally I be Mike. Think, sorry, I also think that uh Morgan Freeman is of a certain height too. Had 
Tim Robbins been a foot shorter, it would not appear that they were so much as friends and equals. And that may have taken away from it also. Do you think that is possible? Because they did change oh. Red to Morgan Freeman and Morgan Freeman's over six foot. So if he's having to talk to someone who's, you know. Well, if you notice it, in most of the shots, you're going to see Andy not standing up and next to people. He's sitting down. Yeah. He's leaning on something. They're masking his height. The one time you get it full on is when he first shows up in prison. But the way that he plays it off, the way he's walking and he's so downtrodden. I mean, even Red says it looked like a stiff breeze would blow him over. So, yeah, I think he pulled that off. Too. So I don't have a problem with him as Andy Dufresne. Um, I know King didn't have a problem with it. Um, he visited the set, got to read the script, got to meet with uh, Frank Darabont, who was the yeah. director, who's done several and King movies. And that kind of thing was happens. This, was this one of the closest movie? Yeah. Um, I have to say this. Um, I think Firestarter is probably the other one that is almost spot on. The, the original Fire, uh, Firestarter. Okay. Yeah. yeah, not the remake. That one is nowhere near as accurate. I haven't seen either. Oh, I've seen bad. parts of the Drew Barrymore, but that was about it. So... Changes to the way a character is from an adaptation to screen can work, and it worked here in this case. I just, my point is, I wouldn't have cast Tim Robbins as Andy. That's, he did a great job. He should have gotten, you know, a nomination if he didn't. Um, but I just I not who did. I would have, it's not who I would have cast. Uh, we and get to be it. honest, I probably like wouldn't have cast. People. I get it. I probably wouldn't have cast Morgan Freeman as Red. It never would have occurred to me, you know? But the casting worked. The, it worked perfectly. So. Yeah. Well, Morgan Freeman, is. this was one of his favorite books um, okay. before they even made it a movie. So when he found out they were making it a movie, he approached Darabont. That works. I'm glad like, I, did. You know, I, I, I want to do something. I think this is actually one of my first Morgan Freeman movies I ever saw. Now that I think about really? it. Really? Yeah. Oh, dude. Um, you haven't seen Glory? I saw it. I just don't remember if I saw it before or after oh, I saw it. Glory is so good. Shawshank. I, I remember seeing Million. Glory. I just don't remember when I saw it. Million Dollar Baby. Oh, yeah. That All I'm going to say. Million Dollar Baby. Clint yeah. Eastwood. Morgan Freeman. Yeah, so is there anybody ending. in particular that you think was not who you would have cast, but was a perfect casting for you, Bill? Um, honestly, Warden uh, Norton. Yeah. I don't think I would have picked that particular actor, but he came off so self-righteous and anal retentive <laughs> that it was perfect yeah i, so, I think the yeah, most perfect I, mean, I, I think the most perfect casting though was by far clancy, oh, clancy brown. brown and clancy yeah. brown is for a long time clancy brown was shorthand for bad guy you know he, he, he just worked you no know, kurgan yeah <laughs> he, he just worked really well as the asshole the heavy Yes, he's played the good guys before, but and it's more what he's doing nowadays, or at least more good guy characters he's had. But Clancy Brown is just that's probably the scariest motherfucker in this movie. To be oh, honest. Oh yeah, he is. I, he, he's the last person I want would want to piss off. Well, they of established that there. right off the bat with the beating of the guy when they go killing. Yeah, I mean, he basically beats them to death. The fish, I mean, without the remorse. Fish. And tells everyone, you know, I hear one more sound, you're all going to the infirmary. And you believe it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he doesn't care. Nope. Dude, it's just I, scary. I think I would not have looked at Frank and thought, but 
the time that he was in jail, it was perfect for it. Uh, the, you know, the, the slick, uh, you know, little late fifties, early sixties kind of, you know, hoodlum. Oh, you mean Tommy? Tommy. Sorry. Did yeah. I say Frank? I don't know. Who he is. Yeah. I, I was trying to figure out who you meant. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm almost there. Names. And then as soon as she says that, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Thank Tommy. You. I love you. Hi, Don. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Everybody say bye, Don. Good night. Night, Told sunshine. The puppets, the puppets started off the show tonight by going, Matt's dagger, the only thing bigger than your generosity. Well, let's see. Your wife. I think your wife is your best attribute. I'm like, okay, that's fair. <laughs> <He did. laughs> that's 100% fair. Lady Catherine, did you have any casting choices that you wanted to bring up other than Tommy? I mean, Tommy was perfect. Those mutton yeah. chops. I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. But at that first was it was like, but then the timing it being and the, you know, late 50s, early 60s, or something like that, it was just just perfect, you know, uh Lords of Flatbush. Yeah. Uh yeah kind of gangster uh sort of guy and i just thought it was perfect i really like that one t you know, uh, Greece. <laughs> when i was watching it yesterday you know who popped into my head when i was when i saw tommy andrew dice clay that's what that hair yeah i, I can I, see I, that it just I, I, my brain just went andrew dice clay you know, well it's totally. that sort of rockabilly era yeah so yeah Bill of Pompadour type rockabilly thing going on, definitely. But I, I love his and Andy's, uh, you know, interactions. He's over there describing how he got busted. And he's like, seriously, maybe you should pick another job. You don't appear very good at this one. <laughs> right. Seriously. <laughs> and he's the only one admitting to being guilty, too. So Yeah, him and Red. Just the two of them. Let's move on to themes. What themes Oof. did the show pick up from the book or did they leave from the book? The big theme, obviously, I think is hope. Yeah. You know, it, it, I mean, you can't get away from that. As long as there's life, there's hope, you know? Um, I'd say hope also. Um, <laughs> sort of the broken institution that is our prison systems. I mean, it, you know, this movie does not make our prison systems look great. No. But uh, I think it's an honest representation as far as what people feel like when they get out after they've been in for 50, 60 years. I mean, you could see where Brooks was coming from, and that is heartbreaking. Yeah. So, you know, it's definitely one of those things that makes you think about, you know, our current system and, you know, try and how could we improve it? I don't know. But, you know, that's something I have to think about. I've been thinking about it for years and I don't have any clear answers. Does it need to change? Are. Absolutely. What changes? Yeah, actually, I think that's no. definitely a theme. There is actually no way to um, to better yourself there other than what he did in the, uh, in the library. Yeah, yeah. I mean, any positive change in that prison came from Andy. Period. Right, but how can you re? How can you say you're rehabilitated when there's no programs for rehabilitation? There's nothing going on there, and then finally he was like, mm, "I don't know what to tell you," you know, and they let him go. I mean, yeah, I don't even know what that up. word means. Hard labor does not <laughs> yeah. rehabilitate; it just makes you worse. You know, when you're no, locked well, up just and doing hard you, labor yeah. all the time. My favorite part was when Andy said to Red, I either, what did he say? And I'm going to probably get it wrong. You either start living or you start dying. Get busy living or get busy, get busy dying. living, dying. get busy dying. And just the way he said that was so or perfect for me. It was just perfect. I was like, God, that just puts it right there. You know, what are you going to do? Are you going to go this way? You're going to go this way. You can't stay in the middle because you're not doing anything. So I like that. 
Entropy is the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. Hopelessness and entropy. Yeah. So, anything else you want to bring up before we start rating things? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, um, like I said, sort of the platonic love relationship that two guys can have without it being toxic. I mean, we, we, we don't get a whole lot of examples. I think this is one of the earliest examples in my life. Yeah, of two guys who, who, cl who clearly love each other, but not in a romantic way. But in a, you know, I, I just want to hang out with you, chill out, do our thing. Hetero life mates? Yeah. Jay and Tyler Bob. The yeah. beginning not of a so healthy, man. but you know. <laughs> What do they call it now? A bromance? Amongst things, yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll go yeah. with that. Yeah, it definitely was one of the first, if not the first, for me that I remember seeing. Um, I'd seen guys with platonic love between each other before, but in literature, not in film. You know, like Frodo and Sam. Right. You know, you can't yeah. get away from Frodo and Sam. That's... um. But this was definitely the first one I remember seeing on screen like that. You know? Well, I think it's the first one that read as poignant as this one read. In the end, you are rooting for Red to get to Andy. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know he's breaking the law. You don't care. You're like, man, I just want him to get to Andy. And, and you know, you know, Andy's going to be able to help him smooth out some of the bumps. And, and maybe they're going to be okay. And I like the way that they did in the end of the movie and not in the book. It was just hope at the end of the book, but they got to get together at the end of the movie. I do think that there have been a lot of uh, previous, let's say, bromance kind of things, but they're mostly in comedies like The Odd Couple and uh, Bosom Buddies and things like that, where they were they were friends, who, but it was mostly through comedy. This was you're more. Gonna see it in a, you're gonna see it hmm? in War Story. You'll see it in War Stories too. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you're almost guaranteed one of them are gonna die in a War Story. Yeah. You're. I mean, you're almost guaranteed. Definitely. So. Did the uh, let me, okay? There we go. Rating the episode. Having read the book, how would you rate the film out of 10? I'm going to start. 10. 10 out of 10. I, I don't see any flaws. There are changes, but I don't think the changes are flaws. I, I, I think all the changes they made improved it for the medium or just improved it in general in one way or another. Um, so, yeah, I'd rate... I'd rate the movie a 10 out of 10, personally. I think I own this movie in more formats than any other movie I own. I have Blu-ray. I have a VHS tape. I have a um, regular DVD. I have it downloaded on my computer. Um, I love this movie. It's right up there with Stand By Me on my King list. Uh, um, the only other one that really fits up there with these two is The Green Mile. So, Great movie. Yeah, I think this Stand By Me and The Green Mile are my absolute tops. It's an absolute 10 for me. I mean, come on. Just hearing Morgan Freeman speak. Oh, love it. Seriously. That's, an, that's um, enough reason to make him the lead or the narrating character. Seriously. Yeah. I wish he narrated see. the book. That would have been so awesome. Yeah. Um, I say 10 also. It, it was... I'm bummed I haven't watched it in so long, but I will make sure that it's in my rotation when I have time just to flip it on it because I hadn't seen it in a long time. I'd never read the book and I'm so happy by reading the book that it was so close to the movie and I, it just made me so happy and I really loved it. So I'm going to say 10. The movie is a 10, 10, 10. I'll tell you one thing the book has done for me, this and the body. I think I'm actually going to read the other two stories, novellas in that anthology. And I'm not, 
I'm not a Stephen King reader. You know? Yeah, I know. I, I was just going to warn you. Um, apt pupil is pretty rough. Um, it's it's more that, the horrors of humanity. That's the one that breathing that, method uh, is Ian a little McKellen more supernatural, movie, right? Yes. Apt pupil is the Ian McKellen. Yeah. I'm yeah, familiar and it with is that a great one. movie. It just, it just never, you know, the subject matter is so dark that it never got the attention it should have. Yeah, and until a week or two ago, I didn't realize that was a Stephen King story. I don't remember oh, that yeah. being played as part of the promotion for it when that movie was coming out. I don't even call it. I don't recall Stephen King being mentioned with that movie, but I don't think a lot of people knew this was too. I think at the time yeah, they weren't. I don't think they did. No. no. I think it was after it was just, I'd seen this. It was just the movie with the long name. Yeah. They were like, what is a Shawshank? Yeah. I remember hearing that a lot. What is a Shawshank? Like, it's a place. How does it redeem you? So, uh, as a standalone film, as impartial as you can be, Bill, how would you rate? the film out of 10 as if you had never read the book. You know, again, it's next to impossible for me. It's so intrinsic. Like I said, I read this book in ninth grade. That's a long I mean, time the, ago. I think I still have the book. I ended up buying it from the library when they had a book fair. Nice. Um, it, it was a small paperback size, it was actually hardcover. It had a sundial on the front, but each order was a different season. And it says different seasons. I, I, I can't separate the two in my brain. I just can't do that. Um, I can tell you my wife has never read the book, and she loves this fucking movie. So Good. Um, Ten for me, I guess. Lady Catherine? I find no difference between reading the book and enjoying the movie and watching the movie solo. I, I loved it both ways. And I wasn't irritated that they'd miss things or they added things. I just thought it turned out perfect. So I really, I enjoyed the movie before I read the book. So I did, I I say 10 also. Yeah. I, and I I'd, don't give that 10s. I'd seen the movie <laughs> probably twice before I read the books, maybe three times. I think three times before I read the book this past week. Um. And I've always loved the movie. I, I, I bounce back and forth between a 9.5 and a 10, but I, I, right now I'll say a 10 for just as a standalone Either film. Either one's as, fair, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I tend not to give 10s that often, except like when I'm really enthused about something and that 10 doesn't always last as a 10. Um, catch me a month from now and it might be a 9.5 again, so... Well, here's so, the weird thing. This movie, when it came out, was a flop. It didn't make really? almost any money at the box office. It's yeah, everybody it didn't loved start it making since. money. It didn't start making money till it hit cable. Uh -huh. VHS rentals, it was one of the top for the year it came out on VHS rentals. And then uh, TBS bought the rights and started playing it. That's when people fell in love with it. That's when people started going, oh, my God, this is an amazing movie. People just didn't go watch it when it was out on film. And that's a shame. Because it's definitely I one of those movies. That... <laughs> yeah, I know I saw it on television. I've never seen this in the theater. I don't even think I oh, remember I it uh, being in the theater. My dad was a huge Stephen King fan. He, he got okay. me into Stephen King. So every time something Stephen King came out, me and him were like, let's go. We're hitting the theaters. So that weekend we would go. That's cool. Yeah, we were big Stephen King fans, but we didn't go to movies. <laughs> My parents weren't movie people, so um, no, we read the books. But I didn't. I did not read the novellas that he had because I'd get one and go, "Oh, I don't want to read this. I want. I want to read a book about you know about Christine or whatever. You know, I I didn't. I didn't read the novellas when I." missed out but i'm glad i'm glad i got to see it to read it i'm glad, I'm glad you got it. to read it too this is Both probably of one of my favorite novellas i've ever read and that's just that's a really rare thing because i'm 
tending to be a science fiction or fantasy snob. If it's not overtly science fiction or fantasy in some way, I tend not to be as enthused about it. But this Rita, Wayworth, Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption was just brilliant. So. Yeah, I think this and The Body, the fact that those two are in the same book is just mind-blowing to me because they're two of my favorite novellas of all time. Anything anybody else wants to bring up? Anything else you want to say? Um, Stephen King's amazing. Yeah, he really he is. is. Yeah. Mango Skank was here. Yeah. <laughs> well, Catherine, thank you for coming on again. It's oh, thank been you for great having, having you on. It's been wonderful Appreciate having you, you on. I've been watching all the videos if I haven't been on for them. Um, Bill, as always, thank you. And thank you for helping steer us towards some Stephen King content. Uh, it was oh, yeah, sorely, right. sorely needed. So thank you guys at home for watching. Please leave us a like, a comment, and subscribe to our channel if you already aren't. And come back soon. We will be, beginning of the year, we will be attacking season three of the expanse and we might be doing it a bit different this time so come back soon and don't forget to be awesome see ya bye